It's big. Um, Invisible China, it's a ninth of the world's population, right? One out of nine people, you know, live in, in rural China. And, you know, they're behind the factory walls. Yeah, you see them out on the street, but they sort of glide by. I'm going to go back to these self-employed workers, to this informal economy. You know, it's the elderly in the villages. It's the, the children they left in the villages. And it's then the migrant families that are hidden you know, up the alleys in the migrant suburbs. Um, and uh, uh, when I first started working in China, <laughs> it was four decades ago, 85% of Chinese lived in rural China then. Uh, you know, a, a higher percentage had families there. Almost everyone, professionals, government officials, college students, everyone had a relative that was in the, the farming community or they came from there. They'd go back and forth. I remember just getting cross country. You'd get on one of these buses and it'd be on these horrible roads. And, you know, a, a province and a half later, you have to stop for the night and you'd be in a village guest house and eat in a, a farmhouse. And, you know, it wasn't invisible 30 to 40 years ago. It's invisible in this sense, you know, less than 5% of students in elite universities have rural roots now, less than 5%. This is the China we know. This is the invisible China that I want to talk about. We've done surveys and in-depth field works in 28 provinces. There's only 30 of them, uh, 650 counties, uh, and almost a million surveys. My, you know, my team and our collaborators of, um, you know, farmers and villagers and families and babies and teachers and parents, uh, doctors and factory, um, you know, self-employed and factory workers. So. You know, when I start to make these macro projections, <laughs> just beware, this is a guy who sits in the villages and looks at the world sometimes too. I'm, I'm not a macroeconomist. Oh, so here we go. How does the rise, this invisible China threaten China's rise? This is the past. So I'm going to show you what, what we were looking at over the last, you know, 10 years. And then I'm going to show you immediately after how we think it's been rolling out. Okay. So um, th this is a very important graph. Here's income 60, 70 years ago, okay? Uh, here's income today, okay? So look, look at these, you know, countries down here, low income traps. So this is Myanmar. Oh my gosh, Myanmar is going to fall more, right? Um, this is, you know, Congo, et cetera, right? Rwanda. Up here are the OECD countries, the staying rich countries, right? So Norway and England and Canada and Australia, they were, they were rich 60 years ago, they're rich today. OK, I'm interested in two sets of countries. One, the graduates. OK, these are all the countries in the world that over the past 60 years have graduated from middle income to high income. And what you see is there's not very many. Right. South Korea, Ireland. Right. Israel. Um, you know, I mean, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, Taiwan territory. You gotta be careful here. And uh, um, that that. You know, in the most recent ones, 20 years ago, like, this is a hard thing to do, um, to go from middle income to high income. Look, most of the countries in the world are these trapped countries, right? It's that they're six years ago, they were middle income, and today they're middle income, okay? You know, and, and yeah, I often say this, this isn't, they're in this nice equilibrium floating on the clouds of a middle. They grow, 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 and collapse, and grow, 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 and collapse, and stagnate, and there's lots of people hurt. Right in, in that process, the thing is, is most of these countries are so, so small. When they collapse, we don't feel them, right? And the rest of the world doesn't shake, right? Obviously, there's uh, China that could be different, right? Um, what is the difference between these countries and these countries? Well, one fundamental difference is at the time of middle income, the level of human capital, and I'm using the OEC definition of human capital quality of a, of a country, it's their entire labor force. So 18 to 65, the, the share of that labor force who's been to high school, that, that has the ability to learn how to learn, to transfer and work in these high income you know, economies. So look at OECD countries. So these are the rich, rich countries, right? Seven or eight out of 10 of this labor force from 18 to 16 have, have gone to high school or higher. Look at the middle income grads. At the time they're middle income, not now, okay, but at the time they're middle income, there was already seven or eight out of 10 were going to high school or above, okay? That, that th at the time they were middle income, before they moved up, 
they already had levels of education that were equal to those of rich countries, okay, of the high income countries. Now, let's look at those trapped countries, right? The ones that grow and collapse and grow and collapse. And, and you know, the Turkeys, the Brazils, the Argentinas of the world. And on average, it's only three or four out of 10. So that means what, six or seven out of 10 people in the economy, uh, in, the, in the labor force, that they're, they're high school dropouts, okay? And which, it, look at, when you're middle income, a high school dropout isn't bad, right? You can do a lot of things, right? There's factory work, there's, there's construction work. And, but once you turn into a high income country, you got high skill, high wage jobs, it, it becomes a problem, okay? And so you see that these middle income countries in the trapped countries have less than half of the share of their pop, of their labor forces that are there have the ability to learn how to learn in these new economies. Okay, um, it's you know it's easy, right? When a country moves from middle income to high income, wages rise. The nature of work changes. Low wage, low skill. The high wage, high skill. And if a large share of that labor force isn't able to participate. You get polarization, right? You you get yeah, you get the people that are you get the people in the Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai that are that are that that live in these in, and work productively in these beautiful cities, but you also you know get another side of the labor force that is that's going to be un, unemployment, underemployment. It turns into crime and social unrest, informality that 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 they 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 just basically leave this the the the, the economy okay uh, and we're going to go back to this informality um and then you know it's f- from the supply side right there's a poor lots of social unrest and crime nobody wants to invest absence of qualified workers nobody wants to invest you get this vicious circle and you get a slowdown or stagnation what's happened to the rest of the world as they try to push up and their labor force isn't ready you see huge amounts of their economy. Look at this is 50%. Look at that line across here where you look at Brazil, Honduras, Indonesia, Mexico, is 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 India large, large 50% or more of their economies are in this informal economy. And you know, it's these workers, right? They, you know, they polish your shoes and and, and hawk goods on the sidewalk, and you know, they live in the slums, right? This is a very important uh, uh, book and uh, uh, set of lectures by Santiago Levy. He's a economist at the Inter-American Development Bank. He used to be at Harvard. And uh, uh, he's talking about Mexico in this book. And he explains, he says, hey, Mexico, look what Mexico has. And now listen, it sounds like China, okay? It had solid macroeconomic performance, China, Mexico. Export success, right? Accumulated physical capital, right? It has all those, but it has very little growth. Why? Because as it got to be, you know, tried to get up the high income, productivity stagnated because it had too big of an informal sector. And what explains this persistent and informal sector is the nature of that labor force. There are so many people when I, they start listening to the argument I make in this book and they sort of say, you know, this book's too late. Hasn't China made it already? But I remember when I was in grad school in the eighties, we were studying Mexico. We were studying Mexico as the new example of a country that was doing it right and was going to make it. It was called the next Taiwan, right? Mexico is admitted to OECD, right? They're a member of the rich man's club. They haven't grown since 1995. Okay, so that's that's sort of the framework I'm looking at. So where's China here? There they are, da 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 da. Right. Um, th- this is you know I showed in the past. I'm going to quickly go to where China is now. Uh, but uh, all kids don't need to go to college. They should be going to high school. Right. It's at this critical stage that they get the skills they're going to need or to be able to gain when, you know, in the future, right? So where's China? It doesn't matter if I give this talk at Tsinghua University to an academic department there, or a a business group in Shanghai, or an NGO group in Shenzhen. When I put this up on the board, people gasp. China, in all those middle-income countries, China has the lowest level of human capital in the middle-income world, the lowest level. Number one, low, (laughs) okay? Really? They go, where's your data, Professor Rosella? Well, it's this little survey 
1.3 billion person survey called the census, right? And, you know, in, they ask, you know, this 50 year old, how much education do you have? And he'll say, you know, a couple of them said no education, primary, highest was lower secondary, here's upper secondary, right? Um, that's high school and above. So, so everybody up here has been to high school, right? And guess what? That's only 30%, okay? 30%, seven out of 10 people in China's economy, you know, out of, out of about 700 million people, 70% of them are high school dropouts. And again, in a middle income, poor middle income country like China, uh, you know, where you make these things, it's good to be a high school dropout, right? But when this gets moved out of the country and you're you know, that, that, you know, these high school drop, what are they gonna do? And look at this, China has lower human capital according to this uh, uh, metric than Turkey, South Africa. It, it, it's, you know, this is a problem. Uh, what do those high school dropouts do in a high income country? You know, in our high income economy, <laughs> A high school dropout has a five times more chance of being unemployed, uh, on welfare, on disability, in jail, uh, on drugs, than they do having a middle income life, okay, a productive middle income life. So being a high school dropout in a rich country is not a, a good thing. So, okay, so now that's all theory, okay? How is it going to affect China? Watch this. This is the evidence that's and and these are using statistics from the government of China. Okay, so they, it should be biased the other way, if anything. Okay, so let's look at these two indicators: employment and wages. Look at here, two thousand and four. Almost seventy percent of of total employment was formal employment. So this is. Uh, secondary and tertiary industries. It's not agriculture. So agriculture is off over there, right? And um, so this is the people who are in, you know, manufacturing, construction, and, and service sector, basically. And that 70% of people belong to a unit. They were in a formal labor that they were paid. Maybe it wasn't very high, but, you know, they had benefits and they were regulated and they were part of a, a unit. But look what's happened over the past 15 years or so, is it's now down to about 40%, okay? So it's flipped. It's gone from six out of 10 in the formal sector of, of China. Now it's it's only four out of 10. It's six out of 10 are in informal sector. Look at the, the number of, of formal jobs in China is going down while informal jobs are, are, are rising. Now let's see where they are, right? So these informal jobs have Man, why it's look what happened. Manufacturing's falling, construction's falling. W what's what's going up? Well, labor intensive. This is informal services. That's the guy riding around the bike. That's those guys in Mexico. It, you know, Lee Ke Chang said, "I'm worried about these guys." Right? Xi Jinping says we wiped out poverty. Lee Ke Chang says, "I'm worried about Tan Fan Jingji, about the put your uh, cart out on the street." <laughs> uh, vendor, right? Um, but he's talking about informal economy. Now, look, at the good news is skilled services. So this is working in Silicon Valley, the inter entertainment industry in, in LA and, uh, you know, doctors and professors and, and in China, that's growing. But look what's growing much, much faster. And that's because all new entrants, they don't have a choice. There's no more jobs in manufacturing. Manufacturing jobs are going down. Construction is topped out and it's going down. Okay, and so look what's happening. As you dump a bunch of people in there, yeah, the, you know, GDP is rising, so demand is rising, but look what's happening to the growth rates. It's, they're falling now. So Lee Hong Bean, my colleague, has a, a really influential paper called The End of Cheap Labor. And that's after 2000 to 2000, you know, 10, 13, he wrote the paper in 2013, wages are going up and China doesn't have cheap wages anymore, right? It's cheaper in Vietnam, it's cheaper in, you know, in Bangladesh. But now we have a paper called The End of End of Cheap Labor. It's what's well, starting to you know, come down. Yeah, formal, formal wages are going up and informal wages are going down. Sounds like the United States, right? And the, and it's, but it's you know, just the beginning of it. Rising supply of informal workers, employment of all other sectors are going down. 
laid off workers and new entrants have one option, informal, low skill service sector. And when the supply of workers into those are greater than demand, means wages fall. And that's what's happening, okay? So what's driving these trends? Uh, and should we expect more in the future? Robots, you know, they are going in China fast. Remember the workers put together, they're gone. Who's in their place? Computer science majors. It, it, uh, you know, uh, if I stood up, you see I'm wearing jeans now. I'm wearing, you know, Levi's. And guess what? They were made in China five years ago. They're made in Ethiopia now. Chinese firms move in, in mass to Bangladesh. All of Samsung electronics are now assembled in Vietnam. We know Vietnam's economy is booming as people have moved there. And of course, COVID-19 and the global recession hasn't helped. Uh, I just saw a paper where... Uh, yes, China's economy grew at through 2%. Guess what? The professional sector has got better. The, the growth rate of wages of the informal sector of the rural wages has dropped by 20%. And so it's been a huge fall. Okay, there. So the question is, should we expect more? Look at the 14th five-year plan and up goes China. They want to invest a lot, a lot into robots and automation because they don't want their industries moving, you know, overseas. And uh, so should we expect more? I think we're going to see more manufacturing fall and construction fall. And I think we're going to see informal economy going up, right? So if the wages of unskilled wages fall, Shouldn't this affect slow automation and globalization? Yes, economists. I'm I'm a good enough economist to know that if wages start to fall, maybe they won't automate, except if the government is the one pushing the policies and they aren't responding to those if you're trying to plan your economy. So um, doesn't the Chinese government know? Uh, Is this a secret? No, it's not a secret. I think the Chinese government do. They have been doing something about it. I don't think enough, but they've done a lot. Um, Look at here in 2005. I'm not looking at the labor force now. I'm looking at 15 to 17 year olds, those kids who should be going to high school. And in 2005, it was only half. Look at here now in 2014, it's almost 90%. China wanted to universalize high school by 2020. They aren't going to make it because of COVID, but uh, you know they are pushing that you know much more. But if they're going to make it, they they got to look at the rural economy because, you know, urban economy is at 93%, higher than Germany. Germany's 92%. U.S. is only 80%, by the way. We're quite low. In the rural economy, it's 70%. So if China's going to meet the goal of universalizing high school education, it needs to focus on the rural youth. And where? Look at Central and Western China. And this isn't poor, poor areas. This is Central and Western China and the, the, the migrant communities. Only half of the kids are going to high school today. So um, that's what we have to do. And um, I, I, I like to look at this. And look at this China today. Here's South Korea and Taiwan in the, South Korea, Taiwan in the 1980s before their rise from middle income. I think everybody went to high school in the whole country, right? But look at Mexico. This Remember, they were supposed to be the next Taiwan, right? There's, but look what happened is all these workers, ugh, yep, they turned to, what do they do, right? They went to the U.S., they turned to informal economy, we saw them hawking stuff, and they went into organized crime. And that has dragged Mexico down. And uh, okay, the challenge for the government is twofold. This is the final conclusion. Get students from poor rural areas into high school, number one. But that's not, you know, they're not going to be part of the labor force until 2035, right? And so we need to provide job training for laid off workers. Uh Uh-oh, this doesn't work very well anywhere in the world. And to make sure that students are ready to learn, this is eating the vitamins, Clay, and uh, uh, getting the babies uh, cognitively developed when they enter high school. Are adult training programs going to be able to focus? And th- they need to give resources to parents, uh, the, I mean, these laid off adult you know, workers, so they can focus on training. They aren't going to learn very fast. And they aren't going to have a job here and go to school at night. They're going to have to have resources to do that. But there's a large scare of people who don't have skills to learn how to learn. I, I don't think these adult training programs are going to work. It's, it, you know, th- that they don't work almost anywhere in the world. They haven't worked in China. So what can be done? 
huge, huge investment into zero to 18 in the entire rural health system. Okay, number one. Okay, I, and I'm talking about, you know, if China has a fiscal problem, then stop going to the moon. Okay, uh, uh, stop building your high speed rail from Xi'an to Urumqi. Right now, China is just starting to build a high speed rail from Chongqing to Kunming. I mean, Chongqing to Kunming, you got to go through a mountain, right? Fly an airplane. How many, how many people go between Chongqing and Kunming? Okay, it's not a bad thing for for everyone there, but this is more important. Probably a lot of people know, uh, or maybe they don't, but the economics world, development economics world, has you know created this new subfield called babynomics, <laughs> right? And, and it's become very very important. So um, Chinese have a saying: "Say San Sui Kan Lao." At at three, you see the future. 90% of your IQ is set by the time you're three. And uh, now you develop a lot of stuff after three. So it's, that's not, that's not important, but, but it's, it's, and as Jim Heckman says, skills begat skills. So you get those cognitive skills at three and it lets you, it lets you begat these other skills later. So the problem is not that the families don't love their kids. I want them to go to high, I want them to go to college. It's that they don't know how to invest. They're raising a peasant. And to, to raise a peasant like they had for 5,000 years, you keep them strong, <laughs> you keep them healthy, you don't let them die, right? And then they grow up to follow a bullock around the fields. Now they got to go to college or they got to go to high school, right? And 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 you say, do you read to your kid? And they, they giggle. <laughs> what do you mean read to my kid? My kid's only, you know, 18 months old. No, do you read to you know? And so huge delays. Nobody's doing psychostimulation of their kids. Okay. The good news is there's been ten randomized control trials over the past five years, and at different age groups, some start at six months, some start at eighteen months. And guess what? Every single one of them increases. Um, uh, and these are randomized trials versus a control group increases cognition. Every one of them. Very, very important study, and so um, that's why our group—we're called the Rural Education Action Project. We should be called the Rural Childhood Education Action Project because we put about 60% of our effort now into zero to three. Because if you don't get zero to three right, nothing else matters later on. So you get the good teachers in the schools, and they can't learn.